Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. For those of you who don't know, my name is Madeleine Helmick, and I'm a senior here at Indiana State. I'm a multidisciplinary studies major with a concentration in gender studies, and right now I'm applying to the history program, the graduate history program at IUPUI. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting my capstone research project. And um, with this research project, I really wanted to find a way to combine gender studies and history. And so I landed on the topic of Terre Haute's red light district. Um, one of my professors, Dr. Laura Hansen, presented the idea to me and it sounded really interesting. And I thought that I could um, look at it with a feminist perspective and maybe pull out some new conclusions. So. That's just a little bit about why I chose this topic. All right, a couple other um, things I should mention. So when I did the literature review, I skimmed through um, newspapers, books, magazines, and um, they all kind of chronicled the red light district as one of the most infamous red light districts in the history. Um, in history in the US in the 20th century. And, but there were very few sources that presented the history from the perspective of the prostitutes and the madams that lived and worked there. And to me, that seemed kind of strange because if you wanted to know what it was like, um, it makes sense to go straight to the source, right? So, um, as I got into the research, I found one source of an oral history that was a, um, a interview with one of the madams that worked there for over 50 years, and that ended up being the main source that I drew from during my research. But first, I'll just start by giving a little bit of background about the district itself, um, in case people aren't familiar. So, in the U.S. Uh, at the turn of the century, the progressive era was kind of happening, going on across the U.S., not just in Terre Haute, and um, all of a sudden there was a calling to quote-unquote segregate vice, and what this meant basically was that instead of there being brothels um, and gambling halls and saloons kind of scattered throughout the cities, the people wanted to segregate it and corner it off into one section of the city so that they could still have the financial benefit um, that these establishments brought without having a negative reputation put on the whole town. And so this happened in Terre Haute too. And the red light district, um, it was in operation from about the 1890s to the early 1970s in Terre Haute. And during that time, um, there were wide variations in estimates, but anywhere between 500 and 900 prostitutes worked in the area at any given time. And the location was, there's also some variation with this too, but between Wabash Avenue and Locust Street and then west of 4th Street. So this is a map from today, but you can see that yes, it is edging onto ISU's campus, which was fascinating to me <laughs> um, because there's that direct connection to this history here. Um, and the thing about the district is that a lot of different people interacted with it, right? So you had um, clergymen, police officers, politicians, ISU presidents, Rose presidents, um, all these different people. And at certain times they supported it and at certain times they wanted to shut it down. And this went back and forth, you know, over the century, depending on you know, what was happening at the time. Another thing that influenced it was wartime measures. Um, during the wars, usually they were kind of forced to shut down for that time and then they would return. So yeah, that kind of gives you an idea of the red light district in Terre Haute. And when I was going through the literature review, the text in the white are direct quotes that I found in my sources that were from newspaper articles that were reporting on the happenings of the district. And if you can look here, um, you see terms like house of ill fame, 
obscene, violent, bloodless. Um, not a single house is a home in the six block tenderloin. Um, and then I do want to point out the, the two quotes that have an asterisk by them. Those specifically were written about African American brothels. Um, and you can see that the language is much worse in those. And then in the pink text, these are direct quotes from the interview with Marian, Madam Marian Harry. And you can see a totally different vibe in her quotes. She describes it as a little village all by itself. Everybody's helping each other. Um, she was the captain of the community chest. Uh, whoever was in the house, we lived like a large family. So when I was going through the literature review, it wasn't like um, they were kind of all saying the same thing. These were like stark differences in the way they're describing the district. And try to picture um, the women that work there based off of these quotes. And I don't know what you're gonna picture, but here's the photo of uh, some of the women that were working there. And this is Madam Edith Brown, who um, is arguably the most successful madam that uh, operated in the district. And this is her with some of her employees. All right, so like I mentioned before, my main source was the oral history, but um, since no other primary sources from the prostitutes or madams, um, since I couldn't find any more, I went to census data to try to frame what their lived experience was. And I'll just go through my, the information that I found from these sources. So the census data from the district was collected in 1900, and then I also used a national census from 1943 to try to get a comparison of how Terre Haute compared to the nation in the century. And these are pages of the census data that I went through. So I went through nine pages that look pretty much like this, uh, over 500 names that I combed through. And the information that I found, um, so any woman that denoted that she was either a keeper of a brothel, a brothel keeper, or labor, labeled her occupation as sporting was included in the sample that I pulled. And we know that they um, reported sporting as their title because Edith Brown is on record saying that herself. And several other historians have used that term um, when they're talking about prostitutes in the district. So of the nine pages from the sixth block of the city, I created a sample of 87 women. And um, these are some of the, the data points that I pulled. So on average, the, the, age, the average age was 24. Um, and compared to the national census, they, they said the average age um, nationally was between 25 to 29. Uh, so this was a bigger <coughs> in Terre Haute, but not much. Um, and then of the women, a quarter of them were divorced and the rest of them were single, except for 14% um, of them were married and can't say for sure, but mostly the married women would have been the madams, not the prostitutes, because it wasn't uncommon for the madams to be married. And then of the 87, 18 of them were mothers, and they were mostly from the Midwest. Um, a few of them were from Colorado, Kansas, Tennessee, but mostly from um, surrounding mid Midwestern states, and there were none of the 87 women were from outside of the U.S. Uh, this was a really interesting point I found in the data. So um, to the far right, one of the questions is, have you ever been unemployed? And it's not saying like in the past year, it's saying like ever in your lifetime, have you been unemployed? And 86 of the women said that they had never been unemployed and one of them didn't answer. Um, only three of the women reported that they were illiterate. And then of the women who reported um, either renting or owning a house, 21 rented and four owned. Okay, so the next major point, point is the interview. And I have the interview here actually. 
So it's really hard to summarize this interview in PowerPoint slides. So what I'm going to do is read to you um, my summary of the most important parts of the interview. In the interview with Meharry, she classified the red light district, also known as the West End, as a little village all by itself from the north side of Cherry Street to the south side of Chestnut Street and from 4th Street west to the river. The African-American brothels were located west of 2nd Street. Other houses, taverns, and saloons resided in the district. Meharry operated brothels from 1922 to 1972 and managed an estimated 1,000 prostitutes. She owned three different houses over the 50-year span the most prominent being the 214 Cherry Street residence. When a woman first started working, she was expected to go to the police station to register her name and place of origin and choose a day off. On her day off, she got her hair done, picked up groceries, and went for her weekly doctor checkup. Meharry's prostitutes had their blood tested for diseases once a month. Even though Meharry did get her employees get half of her employees pay, she provided them with benefits like housing, food, laundry service, and financial credit. Additionally, most girls went home to be with their families on the holidays. In the 1940s, Meharry said her girls made around $25 to $30 a day. Some of her workers supported their families, children, or a pimp with their earnings. Meharry did not allow her girls to have abortions, and several of them had babies while working for her. Meharry did not have any strict rules other than that the prostitutes should look presentable, arrive to breakfast by 10 in the morning, never cause a scene in public, and never get involved with college boys. <laughs> Meharry believed that her and her girls lived like a large family. They played music together and she read to them at night frequently. This is a quote. The only thing that disrupted us was when a customer would come in, said Meharry. They passed their time talking, singing, dancing, laughing, crocheting, and sewing. Even though gaining acceptance into the business was difficult for Meharry as a newcomer, she described the district as a caring community. Everybody helped each other, she said. Meharry stated that the prostitutes added to community charitable efforts by giving to fundraisers for churches, hospitals, and police fundraisers often. Moreover, the businesses on Wabash Avenue thrived on the West End. In fact, one business owner leaked to Meharry that the police were going to shut her down under a wartime measure so she could tell the girls to leave before the police could reach her house. Prostitutes bought clothing, hats, shoes, jewelry, furs, and even automobiles on the Wabash Strip. Brothel customers were mostly middle-aged men, but they ranged from politicians to preachers to laborers to teachers and coaches to suburban husbands. Meharry guessed that up to 90% of her business came from out of town, but not everyone that came to the house was a client. Meharry kept her house open 24 hours a day because people would come in at all hours to have a cup of coffee and conversation. Meharry believed a four-tiered caste system existed within the district, a brothel's combination of running water, indoor plumbing, air conditioning, furnishings, and housekeeping and cooks determined its rank in the caste system. The prostitutes' wardrobe, intelligence, speaking ability, physical appearance, manners, and soberness dictated which level of brothel she would be accepted to work in. However, physical appearance was not always the most important attribute of a prostitute. This is a quote from Meharry. She might be as ugly as a scarecrow and make the most money with her personality. <laughs> Conversely, sometimes the prettiest women were the ones that had the most trouble with clients because men would come, become obsessed and abusive towards them. Around the time of World War I, the brothels were shut down because of their proximity to Rose Polytechnic Institute. During World War II, Meharry understood that the brothels shut down and the prostitutes were forced to leave town because the government did not trust prostitutes to keep soldiers secrets. She believed the government thought some prostitutes might be spies. Throughout the years, Meharry said mayors would play 
quote, political football with the brothels, placing restrictions on them depending on what church people and voters wanted at the time. Regardless of power shifts, the brothels never stayed closed for long because the customers always came back. Um, she says, you just went on because it's a question of economics. You know you're going to have to eat and pay rent, and if you didn't work, you couldn't do it. So everybody just went on their way. Many times they just kept working with the shades pulled down. Okay, so, oh, I should have mentioned, this photo is the only photo that I could find of Meharry, and she's um, the woman holding the picture frame. And this is just from a newspaper article. She was gifting this photo of Eugene Debs back to the museum. So I think from the interview, um, we really got an inside look onto kind of the environment in the house and um, the benefits of living in the brothel. And you learned about how they, their pastimes, um, their community charitable efforts, and um, also the caste system, right? So not all the brothels were the same. Obviously, this is just speaking for her own brothel. And she points out that not everybody was benefiting equally from this business. So here are a few more photos of women from the district. Um, so my conclusions were that the women were definitely financially self-sufficient. Um, they had benefits that other women working wouldn't have. You know, they had housing, they had medical benefits, and even financial credit. Um, and the thing that I I found most interesting is that they really had a community of women, which in 1940s, I mean, all the way up to the 1970s, stay-at-home moms were extremely isolated and they wouldn't have had the same sense of community that the women in the brothels probably found. Um, and at least for Meharry's, they were living a middle-class lifestyle, right? And um, that also may not have been true um, of a woman of a woman working, you know, a, a part-time job elsewhere. And um, the thing that really stuck out to me is that she was specific about the the racial segregation and the class division in the district and I didn't really see other sources get into that as much because it really took somebody from the inside to understand that. Um, and the last thing is that most of the newspaper articles uh, framed that the people from the outside were the ones that controlled the businesses but from her perspective it seemed kind of flipped that the, the women themselves and the customers determined when the business was open or closed. So my recommendations, uh, really what <laughs> this project made me realize is that you won't find what you aren't looking for. And what I mean by that is the other, um, some historians have written very well and included these women in their works. The most recent Wicked Terre Haute just came out in 2019, and he also included passages from this oral history. Um, but before this, you know, in the literature review, I wasn't really finding that they did include many perspectives of the women, if at all. And so what I would say in the future is that we should look for first, more first-person accounts if they do exist. Um, and if they don't, it's really not too late to still collect more oral histories because some of, if this just shut down in the 1970s, um, there are probably still living relatives that could either, um, you could interview somebody that worked there themselves or a sibling or aunt or uncle or somebody that may have spoken to them. Um, and since this will be a challenge because of age and desire to stay anonymous, I think that the next step would be to dig further into the census data. And with the census data, if I had more time, what I would have liked to have done is map out um, and identify when or if social shifts took place in the district. I think you might be able to find, you know, if the, if the women did stay segregated or what the census data could tell you 
more about um, if they changed during wartime measures or um, when the progressive era was happening. I think Ms. Sintestega could tell us more about what was happening during those times. And lastly, this was maybe more outside the box, but I did find a study from Boston University where they did an archeological dig of the site. Um, and the, the brothel there was a little bit earlier in the 1800s, but the things that they found during the dig, um, they found hairbrushes, medicines, oils, jewelry, um, toothbrushes, powder, and what this proved is that there was high concern for physical appearance, there was high concern for health, and also for disease and pregnancy prevention, which they didn't know before the dig. So if, as we are, you know, all the businesses have been torn down, but as if they're rebuilding, we could still be looking for these types of artifacts and think about what they could tell us about the women that lived and worked there. Here are my references, and in conclusion, my hope is that researchers and historians writing about Terre Haute's red light district history in the future will apply um, a similar feminist perspective so we can begin to tell a more inclusive and true version of this history. Does anyone have any questions? What uh, was the legal status of the brothels? I mean, you know, this like 50 year period, were they ever legal? Were they, I mean, were, were anybody prosecuted? How did that look? Yeah, it's really mysterious. Okay. So <laughs> what I found was before um, prohibition, there really wasn't any, there was no really arrest or kind of trying to restrict them at all. And then after Prohibition, they kind of got grouped in with the saloons and the gambling halls. And so then there was a little bit more pushback. But um, what I found is that the women were prosecuted um, alongside the men. So there wasn't like uneven prosecution. Like if a man was found with a prostitute, he would be arrested as well. Um, and then, yeah, mostly it was just like an avoidance where like, we know this is going on, but as long as you go <coughs> over here, like, we, won't, we won't do anything. And really what I found was that most of the times if there was reports, it would have something to do with like an ISU student or a Rome student was found over there. And that's why it wasn't surprising that when Harry got there, like, no college boys, because then the ISU president or whoever would, you know, call in the police and say like, we can't have this happening. <laughs> <laughs>